Have you fallen in love or fallen into fantasy? There is a tremendous difference and I'm sure you've stumbled into romantic projection at least once in your life. Well, the good news is I've got the three wise men of unconscious dynamics, John, James and Aldo, to give us some excellent psychological advice about the nature of romantic projection. But I'm firstly going to frame out today's conversation with a very troublesome and pitiless situation from the friend of one of my viewers and it probably describes something that you've experienced at least once or twice before. Coming up on the screen, check out this very particular, very unfortunate dynamic. Question from the screen. I have a friend who very occasionally meets someone he likes and has a strong connection with, but then he has a habit of obsessively fantasizing about her in the time between seeing her again. I'm sure that this friend is definitely not the viewer asking the question, but let's continue. By that time, he has dreamt dozens of intimate conversations with her, imagined having intimacy with her, and in his mind been living happily married together for the last five years. And then the next time he does see her, not only is he exhausted from having a make-believe relationship, he is also terrified that she'll reject him and shatter his fantasy, which usually results in that very thing happening. Firstly, what is the source of these fantasies? And secondly, what books would you recommend for my friend, who of course is not the questioner? Well, this friend is in a very particular circumstance, and at the absolute core, they are stuck in romantic projection. There are th a few layers to this conversation, so I'm going to try and unpack them over the course of the next 15 minutes or so. Fundamentally, they are living in fantasy, but we have to understand why the fantasy is being repeated on loop and what's trying to be accomplished at an interior psychological level. We'll come to the three books I held up in the beginning in just a moment. Fundamentally, the baseline framing that I want you to understand is that daydreams, even the most simple daydream of seeing someone and seeing them as a very attractive person and then starting to add a little narrative like, oh, I bet they're the kind of person who, insert the blank, you see an attractive stranger on the street, you're instantly taken by their physical appearance, and you say, oh, I bet they're the kind of person who does that certain type of thing in the bedroom, or I bet they're the kind of person who has a lot of money, or I bet they're the kind of person who has a really sweet and loving heart. It doesn't matter what your intimate projection might be. Maybe it's a bedroom encounter, maybe it's something about their status and their success, or maybe it's about their lovability and how kind and compassionate they are. All of them are projections, and you're projecting to close the distance between you. The fundamental essence of a projection is that a projection is launched towards a target, and it closes psychological distance. They need to have a hook, for the projection to land on. You can't land a projection on someone who isn't a suitable match, which is why they usually need to be physically attractive, or in some more sophisticated individuals, maybe they've got intelligence in their eyes and you're not attracted to physicality. By and large, most of us do form the initial connection based on physical attraction and pheromones and a variety of unconscious cues. You close the psychological distance with the projection. This is completely normal. It's something we'll never escape from. It is a default human strategy of keeping ourselves safe. Because if you understand the safety mechanism, you then can start to understand the romantic safety which we're trying to form through the fantasy life. The friend of today's questioner keeps falling into this particular trap of imagining not just all of the beautiful bedroom encounters, but actually the happily married happily ever after kind of scenario, and that's because of some kind of unmet wound, or un unhealed wound, and an unmet need from the past, which is being soothed over, or otherwise bypassed, or otherwise hush-hush, as a result of the romantic story. It doesn't matter what your particular version of the narrative might be. For some people, they might imagine a partner who's got great wealth and great success. Someone else might imagine a partner who's living on the wild side and got all kinds of amazing tricks in the bedroom. Generally, it falls into those two categories. Either it's someone who's incredibly high status or someone who's incredibly intimate and they look the way that you want them to look and you imagine that they're going to be all kinds of things. Um, yeah, down there, I'm trying to avoid the word so that this doesn't get too heavily censored or demonetized or flagged. But you understand what I'm saying. It doesn't matter what the projection might be. 
What's fundamentally happening is that you are caught in the loop because you are trying to fix something that unfortunately was either broken or at the very least bruised in the past. There's some unmet need for love, but love can also be a need for status, a need for self-esteem, a low self-worth issue, some kind of wounding around abandonment. The fundamental question at the core of romantic projection is do I matter enough for you to want me? Because the real, real conversation behind any unconscious dynamic isn't about them. It's about who you get to be when you're with them. And of course, it's not about them. We're talking about just the projective faculty that, that you're projecting outwards. Who could you be if you were with them or if you were with the version of them that you imagine them to be. We'll return to this question, and this is a good moment to bring up the three books I want you to read in your own time. First, John Sanford, The Invisible Partners, a fantastic Jungian tape on the interior masculine and interior feminine. We then have The Eden Project by James Hollis, which is a wonderful, also Jungian take on the nature of romantic projection, specifically with a focus more towards the mythological and the anima and the animus. And finally, we have Eros and Pathos. You guessed it, it's another the Jungian therapist take on the nature of projection with more of a focus on peeling back. The reason you want to read all three of these together is they take the same topic from different angles and perspectives, from very earthy with invisible partners to kind of crossing over into the mythological with uh, the anima and animus with Eden Project and then moving into more uh, philosophically eros and pathos kind of territory with you have to read these books in yourself. I've covered these books multiple times in this channel. I devoted an entire module towards romantic projection and romantic issues inside of the Shadow Work Library. Inside the course, I spent three hours looking at these issues as well as other issues over the course of another 20 plus hours. It's the best place to work with me, but for the sake of this single video, romantic projection stems from unsafety and the various mechanisms that you'll try and project out safety into the world fundamentally relate back to your own persona or your own ego or some kind of emotional need which isn't met. You're trying to keep yourself safe and everyone has a different strategy of safety but fundamentally you want to try and give yourself a permission slip of who you could be if you were with them. What your life could look like is the ultimate fixation of any romantic fantasy because even if you're imagining this incredible scene where they're giving you all kinds of pleasure in the most raw and visceral and physical sense and they're the best lover that you've ever had, you're not necessarily focused on them. You're focused on how good you feel, even if it's you just watching the scene because you're dissociated and you're talking head on the stick and you're actually not connected with genital consciousness, definitely not your heart. You might think that you're experiencing stimulation, but really it's just a, it's a dream theater that's playing out in real time. It's about you. It's fundamentally about you. Today's questioner said that he got into this situation, I'm looking at the question now, where he's in this make-believe re relationship and he's repeating over the idea of having intimate conversations and intimate interactions, which is a very honest way of putting it. And sometimes men and women can get caught in this pattern of just seeing romantic projection as something which is about more of a physical fulfillment. But the conversational element is really important to focus on because you're looking at the unmet need of intellectual witnessing or even emotional witnessing, usually both of them together. One of the major reasons that people go and cheat on their partners isn't because of the person being attra more attractive, objectively speaking, than their current partner. It's because they want to be witnessed or seen or otherwise understood by someone that understands them in a bit a bit of a different way, or maybe a significantly different way from their current partner. They want to be in a situation where they're witnessed intellectually, witnessed emotionally, and because there's not the communication pathways and there's not the level of nuance within the relationship, of course, betrayal and infidelity is one of the major consequences of unmet needs. Before that even happens, there's usually fantasizing, usually fantasizing about how the other partner, the other love interest, the affair is going to bring fulfillment. And this is a very common trap. And statistically speaking, if you're triggered by this conversation over the course of a lifetime, nearly every single person watching this video will either cheat on their partner or be cheated on by their partner. Either of those situations will happen and they both happen 
when peeled back because of unresolved romantic fantasy, there's a lack of awareness of the inner and the outer and the distinction between the two, because you're layering on so much extra information. And I was actually reading a book this morning, which is the surprise book from, yeah, from this entire video by Robert Johnson, Living with the Heavenly Woman. I'm still in the process of reading this, and I got to this page and literally stopped reading this in the sunshine on the porch, and it's a wonderful quote that ties in this idea of the anima, which is the interior feminine within the man. But if you're a woman and you're listening to this, you can also substitute this to animus. It's basically about the idea of your archetypal inner reality being overlaid on someone else. Again, not because of who they are, but because of who they could be for you and who you could feel like in relationship to them. The fundamental idea for you to really pause on and reflect with, who do you actually want to be? Who do you want to feel like? What kind of status do you want? What kind of bodily sensations do you want? It's all about you, you, you. It's never about them. It's a selfish issue. And that's fine. I'm not trying to shame anyone. But understanding projection being something which emanates from here, from here, and maybe from down there, all of that being launched out, you can start to make it more complex with the anima and the archetypes. But before you even go into territory like this, just accept that it's never, ever about them. Quoting now from Robert Johnson, yet again, an, another Jungian psychologist. The Jungians have a particularly good take on projection because it's one of the main tenets of healing the old wounds. Quote about anima contaminations from a book which is talking about the feminine within the man. Traditionally, a man spends, and this is, this is funny, it's got the idea of a honeymoon. Traditionally, a man spends a month, brackets, it is called a honeymoon because it is sweet for the length of a month in idyllic bliss with his new wife then begins the reality process of discovering that his wife is not his anima and is not exactly carrying his expectations of woman. And again, you can substitute this for a husband or a boyfriend. To discover that one's wife is not one's anima, which means not one's projection, indeed one has many expectations, so, 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 is the beginning of a relationship. Final quote. Anything preceding was projection, unless both were unusually conscious of the fine art of relating. To contaminate one's wife with his anima expectations is an error that is commonplace in our world. What woman has not had what woman has had to inform her husband that she is indeed a person and not the embodiment of his expectations? And it runs both ways. Men can also be pedestalized or demonized. Projections can go into fascination and fixation. Fascination and fixation can be either a very positive fascination or a very negatively tinted fascination. Again, if you really watch for your projections, maybe the friend of today's questioner might find that after about five weeks or six weeks of fantasizing about the person, they suddenly go into a demonic projection and they see them as the trash on the street, the dirt beneath their shoe, or some other degrading possibility. You'll launch in either direction because projections launch out suddenly, and if you're tinting it with golden shadow or with darker, more malicious shadow, it doesn't matter which way you're going, you're out of touch with reality. You can just catch the moment. You can slow it down. The process of dissolving projections is to realize that you have made the projection in the first place, and in that window of opportunity, you can actually start to dissolve the automatic, compulsive, self-soothing narrative. The narrative may be one element, the fantasy could be another element, there's some distinction between narratives and fantasies, because that narrative, generally speaking, is a longer arc of an imagined relationship, an imagined marriage. A fantasy could be just a scene, like a scene from a movie rather than the whole movie. That's a way to maybe describe it. There's different depths of projection. If you're the kind of person that imagines whole movie-like relationships, you're particularly deep down the rabbit hole. If you're the kind of person who's walking out on the street, you see someone that's attractive, and you imagine what it would be like to be with them in an intimate manner, that's more pure fantasy. There's not so much story attached to it. It's easier to work with pure fantasy because it's closer towards um, how would you feel if you're getting pleasure. It's the same principle with a narrative, it's just that sometimes people who have more sophisticated, more developed, or otherwise more dissociative imaginary identities, they can get fixed in the narrative because it almost feels essentially gratifying to play with imagination. The imagination itself becomes 
something which is erotic and if you look at female psychology in particular there's a lot to be said for foreplay or otherwise using imaginative romantic means where there's lots of storytelling and there's scene making men generally don't care for these things just as much but there are also many men out there who do enjoy going down the narrative pathway and imagining the possibilities there's many ways to take the conversation you can see that i really am trying to cover as much as i can but i'm going to be hopelessly um yeah, hopelessly lost compared to the depths of these three wise teachers altogether. I can't cover everything. The final bit of practical advice I want you to really take from this video. Once you've realized that your projections are going to happen, and you've realized that the projection is something about an unmet need inside yourself, is to fundamentally, and this is just such basic advice, is to try and meet the needs in yourself, but also to have the honest recognition that as humans, and as a human that you are in particular, you're most likely going to need to have a significant intimate partner in your life to be mentally well. That's a controversial thing to say these days, especially in an era where we believe that we can be fully self-sustaining. There's this idea in healing circles that you can be everything that you need, you don't need the outer world for validation or approval, but it's just not true. The last four years of me working with clients has taught me at a very deep and unavoidable level that relationship issues and romantic problems and romantic longing and the desire for partnership is one of the primary needs and drives for almost every single client that I've worked with. And even the ones where we're looking at things like career or personal spiritual fulfillment, it's because they've already figured out their relationship. They're already in a fulfilling relationship that's healthy enough and doesn't have massive issues and massive holes that we need to talk about. So we look elsewhere. But for someone who hasn't got a relationship, someone who hasn't felt love or been loved or given love, who hasn't learned those lessons and had that experience, there's always that need. And it might be conditioning, it might be cultural hypnosis in one form or another, maybe too many romantic songs or incredible movies or whatever it might be. I don't think that's intellectually honest. There's a deep need for communion within every man and every woman. And if you haven't had that experience, you're going to be trying to find ways to resolve that issue, even if it's just a biological drive towards procreation, which is running in the unconscious body. It's a complex topic, but I want you to accept that simultaneously, you do have things in your control and you can be self-fulfilling you can take the whole world into your heart and be all that you ever desire and yet you will also be fundamentally incomplete not in a shameful way but you will be fundamentally incomplete because we're not meant to live in isolation for the entirety of our lives we came from the act of intimate union you wouldn't be here listening to this without your mother and your father having that act of intimate union and that's where most of us are going. Most of us are going that way in life. And even if you're not going to do it physically in this lifetime, you're going to find a substitute with your career, with a charity, with some kind of spiritual focus, or with, with something else at a level of consciousness of your, of your choosing that will imitate that marriage dynamic or that union dynamic. It's a whole conversation. And what do I suggest? Final, final, final sentence. Know that your projections are about you. It's never about them. Catch the moment when you're launching the projection, open up that window of possibility, those few seconds where you realize, hmm, I actually know nothing about that woman, or I know nothing about that wham, uh, that man, that wham. I know nothing about wham. I know nothing about wham. However, it's probably a projection. It's probably not true, is it? Hmm. Okay. And then it comes back and hits you from the side of the head and later in that day you think, oh, that woman at the gym, or, oh, that man at the grocery store, or, oh, that person who sent me a message. It doesn't f***ing matter. It doesn't f matter. I'm gonna have to bleep out those words, I'm trying not to swear on this channel, but it doesn't matter. Just enter into that space and then you can have relationships with real people as a real person. I'll see you in the next video. It's over here. We'll talk about some of the trauma dynamics beneath the romantic projection conversation.